All right. I want to welcome everybody today to our webinar, Meeting Transparency Requirements for LEAD Version 4 and Version 4.1. I'm Tad Radzinski. I'll be uh, presenting today this webinar. And uh, we have a number of people still signing in. I'm, I'm going to get started, though, because uh, I know we only have an hour, and I want to be able to get through all the material. So I want to welcome everyone today to this, this webinar. I'm excited to speak to you about uh, transparency. This is a big topic that uh, we're seeing and hearing a lot about for the last few years. A lot of activity out in the green building marketplace now around transparency and a lot of product manufacturers trying to meet those requirements. And what I want to do today is talk uh, a little bit about multi-attribute labels and then material ingredient reporting and also uh, environmental product declarations and various uh, transparency documents and how they're meeting the, the various requirements for LEED and, and other uh, green building standards as we go forward. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get rolling into the webinar. Uh, everybody is muted on this because it is a webinar. However, I am uh, hoping that there will be questions because I, I, this is much more interesting when we actually can communicate and have some questions. So there's a question box on your control panel for the uh, GoToWebinar, which will allow you to type your questions into the box. Uh, type them in as I'm going through, and I'm going to plan to go through the presentation, and then I will be coming back to the questions uh, at the end. And I actually do have some questions for some of you that I'll throw out. Also, I wanted to uh, let you know that this is being recorded, and the recording will be available. So if you want to come back to this, or you, if you have any colleagues that you would like to listen to this in the future, you'll be able to send them back to the uh, recording. We are also in process on getting this uh, approved by uh, GBCI and AIA, and uh, we will follow up after the webinar for all the folks that have attended it and the folks that end up listening to the recording to make sure you're able to get credit for participating in this, uh, you know, for the CEUs that are available. So again, Tad Redzinski here, looking forward to rolling through our learning objectives today. Uh, we definitely want to talk about what's driving transparency, what's going on in the green building marketplace, and actually the, actually the sustainable purchasing marketplace. Both of those areas are, are very hot right now and very uh, much driving the need for looking at environmental product uh, impacts as well as uh, material ingredients in, in products. I want to also talk about multi-attribute labels. That is an area where uh, there is a lot of value to them. And uh, for those of you that are actually trying to make decisions and selections on products that you are putting in buildings, or if you're trying to document uh, things for LEED certification, the multi-attribute certifications are really helpful for that. I also want to talk about uh, material ingredient reporting and a little bit about environmental product declarations because I think that's an area where a lot of people struggle. They don't really understand uh, how these material ingredient reports can work because there's there's multiple platforms that can be used, like uh, health product declarations and declare labels and manufacturers inventories and product lens and cradle to cradle and all that kind of thing. So I definitely think it's important that we uh, take a look at those and give you a, an understanding of what to look for. How do you know when something is compliant or not compliant with lead requirements? And then I also want to talk about uh, the value of all this information in designing more sustainable buildings. Everybody on this call, including myself, are definitely uh, very passionate and active in the building space. Otherwise, you wouldn't be joining today. So it is important that we know that we have a big role in uh, the materials we select, the products we integrate into the buildings, and how that can affect the overall embodied carbon of a building, the overall performance of a building, the health and productivity of the occupants in the building. And we'll be talking about how we use this information to really design more sustainable buildings. We all know that this transparency thing is, is definitely something that's here to stay. Uh, it started a while back when you know the LEED standards came out. And really, it's about understanding uh, more than just the aesthetic, uh, the look of the product, you know, the, the performance characteristics. It's, it's about understanding what are the environmental impacts of the product from cradle to grave and what are some of the uh, ingredients that are contained within the products. And we also have to think about uh, not only knowing the ingredients, but are there any risks or hazards of exposure in those ingredients? 
and we'll be talking about that. And, and what's interesting, a lot of times uh, we're only zeroing in on the products that we can see in a building. For example, you can see here we've got images of doors and flooring and ceilings and furniture and all kinds of different things. However, there's also a lot of infrastructure and materials that go behind the wall, like this wire that you see here on the, on the screen. And that wire is something that, you know, there's a lot of it going into buildings. There's uh, definitely transparency documents available for many wire and, and cable products, as well as other things that we may not see that are hidden behind the walls, like, uh, you know, uh, connectors and switches and all kinds of other things that are important for the overall performance of the building. <clears throat> the next slide I have here is basically showing a whole bunch of letters that came from various architecture firms back in 2013 and 2014. And these were sent to many different uh, building product manufacturers. And basically these letters were saying things like, we are wondering how you, the product manufacturer, is going to comply with the new requirements coming out in LEED version 4 in regard to environmental product declarations and material ingredient uh, reporting and disclosure. And some of these letters even went so far as to say that if you do not decide to do these things like create EPDs or HPDs uh, or declare labels, et cetera, then there's a possibility we will no longer specify your products or include you in our library. And that really motivated the product manufacturers to get serious and create those documents. And now the manufacturers have clearly stepped up. There's uh, thousands of environmental product declarations, hundreds of HBDs, declare labels, manufacturers inventories being developed, which will allow uh, you, the architects, designers, lead consultants, building owners, to make decisions on what products you're selecting and how they're going to be integrated into the building. So very important to note that this information is definitely available and LEED version four was definitely a driver. However, uh, International Green Construction Code, the National Green Building Standard and uh, the Living Building Challenge are all different standards that are looking for this transparency information. And uh, there's the ability to get certified and earn points in the case of the International Green Construction Code, that is a code and not a voluntary standard. So EPDs are definitely recognized there, along with other things like the National Green Building Standard and other areas. Uh, we're all on the phone to talk about uh, LEED today. And uh, I'm sure most of you are aware that LEED is one of the most popular green building certifications, at least in North America and other parts of the world. Uh, 90 some thousand LEED certified buildings worldwide, 19 billion square feet, uh, and pretty much the assurance that any project over $50 million has a 71% chance that it's seeking LEED certification. I would even say, I would even go so far to say that LEED is kind of, in many cases, almost expected for a lot of buildings. Uh, I do know that there's right now f over 14,000 LEED version 2009 or, or version three buildings still that need to be certified and 5,655 lead version four is registered and in process. And then another 144 buildings already registered to leave E4.1. So what this looks like to me is, you know, if I'm uh, looking ahead here, that's this is over 20, 20,000 buildings that are seeking lead certification that are going to be looking for some type of material ingredient transparency or some type of uh, environmental product transparency when you're starting to talk about EPDs and other things. And uh, a lot of activity out there, a lot of movement. And just so you also know that in LEED version 4.1, uh, the updates to that have included the requirement or the ability to earn points within those standards uh, for lead e-bomb and also lead homes for products that actually have transparency documents such as EPDs, HPDs, Declare, and manufacturer's inventories. So it's spreading not just into new construction, but it's going into other versions and homes is actually catching up. So the fact that there's 1,622 uh, registered homes under lead V4, those homes can actually really switch over to B4.1, as well as any other of these projects here, USGBC is making it really easy if you want to do V4.1 over V4. Uh, I know that our sister company, Sustainable Solutions, has 
quite a number of projects and they're actually um, going to be switching over to V4.1 for the, the V4s. And they're looking at pulling in some of the V4 and 4.1 credits into the 2009 projects. So a lot of opportunity here. Living Building Challenge, uh, not nearly as many uh, projects registered, only 380. This is much harder to achieve. However, there is transparency requirements, especially around material ingredient reporting. Uh, as many of you may know, the, this particular standard actually has a red list of materials that are not uh, permitted to be utilized in the building except under certain exceptions. So again, very challenging standard to meet, uh, very costly and time-consuming standard, and there's a lot of questions around the red list. You know, uh, what is the value of it? Is it, ha is it science-based, all that kind of thing. However, uh, this is something that is gain, gaining traction and uh, will continue to, to be utilized in various um, areas and various uh, buildings. Of the 380 projects registered, my understanding is about uh, more than half of them are single family residential. We also have the well standard, which is you know, definitely a nice marriage of not a, making a, a building uh, more efficient and healthy through LEED. But this actually integrates uh, aspects of a building to encourage health and wellness. Things like moving elevators so you can get more people to take the stairs and providing well rooms and, and nursing rooms for people, uh, creating lots of daylight, you know, uh, providing lots of fresh air and, and places for people to work out and exercise and have you know, places to feel better in their work. So great marriage. Also some requirements in here for transparency documents, especially around material ingredient reporting and things like that. Also to remember that in the United States and other parts of the world, there are drivers outside of LEED. Uh, Executive Order 13693 was issued by the Obama administration and required that all federal agencies purchase products uh, that had sustainable attrib attributes. And uh, that uh, executive order is no longer being utilized. However, the federal acquisition regulations still exist that do require sustainable purchasing in the, in the federal government. We're also seeing states like Oregon uh, hiring specialists in toxicology to start looking at material ingredient reporting information about products they buy uh, throughout the state. California just passed a law recently requiring building products to start disclosing information about embodied carbon in the products. And then everybody else you see listed on here, the Sustainable Purchasing Leadership Council, uh, Arizona State University, DC government, et cetera, all of these groups are driving more around transparency and understanding uh, sustainable purchasing. Uh, Green Circle is a founding member of the Sustainable Purchasing Leadership Council, and uh, that organization has grown significantly now as more and more people are writing into their purchasing policies uh, requirements to look at life cycle impacts of products and material ingredients in products, not just for construction of buildings, but for everyday operations. So we're gonna see more and more of this required, and you know that's an important aspect here. And here at Green Circle, you know we're really uh, focused on making sure that uh, we're assisting our customers that certify with us to get the most value out of their certifications to drive, uh, you know, this information out to the world. I like to joke about the fact that these uh, new credits or credits within LEED V4 and V4.1 are actually the new bike rack because to earn uh, one point in these uh, areas under materials and resources for environmental product declarations and material ingredients, you only have to select 20 permanently installed products from at least five manufacturers that have EPDs and HPDs. And we are seeing uh, specifications being written now asking for third-party verified HPDs and declare labels and manufacturer's inventories. We're seeing the requirements for products to provide uh, you know, EPDs when they're making their submittals, multi-attribute labels requirements for those for many different product categories. And uh, this numbers game will go on for a little while and I know that uh, our sister company has uh, multiple lead projects. They've, they've definitely completed a few V4s now, and they have earned these uh, credits. Also to, wanted to point out that if you can select uh, 40 permanently installed products from at least five manufacturers that have uh, EPDs or material ingredient reports like manufacturer's inventories or declare or HPD, 
then you can actually earn two points through exemplary performance. So big big things going on. There's a, there's movement now with V4.1 on material ingredient optimization and environmental products uh, declarations. You know, demonstrating optimized products with reduced environmental impacts, especially embodied carbon. So a lot of opportunities here to uh, earn points, but I just don't want us to be thinking this is only a point earning opportunity. It's more uh, a great opportunity to really look at the documents that are being generated, like the EPDs and the HPDs and the declare labels and the manufacturer's inventories, and start to understand what type of products are going into the buildings, looking for products that are showing optimization, looking for products that have lower embodied carbon and, and, and different things like that to make selections of the products. So I know that just about everybody on this call has probably been looking to find some of this information. Hey, we're working on a building, we gotta do our lead documentation or we're writing our specs and we're trying to find the right products you know, based on the information and there's so many places you have to look. You could be going to Mindful Materials or you can go to Sustainable Minds or you can go to uh, you know, other platforms like uh, Eco Scorecard. You could go to websites of the manufacturers. You can look at the HPDC collaborative uh, listings, cradle to cradle, all kinds of locations trying to find this information. And there's a lot of it that's needed. So uh, what we came up with that green circle is our uh, certified environmental facts label. and this label was developed based on a lot of feedback and input from product manufacturers, lead consultants, architects and designers, uh, discussions with uh, folks within USGBC and the federal government. And basically what we try to do is create a label that looks like a nutrition label that allows you, the specifier or the designer or the building owner, to look at the products and, and get a quick snapshot of what's going on with the product. And, the beautiful thing about this is everything on the label is third-party verified. And as you can see by uh, this infographic that we developed, there's many of the attributes that are listed on here for product-specific uh, material ingredient reporting and manufacturing-specific that can be utilized to meet lead requirements. So if you you know look simply at the top of this, for example, recycled content is fully disclosed and third-party verified in this. If you are looking for companies that have product stewardship activities and they have uh, take back programs, that's clearly illustrated for. If you're looking for products that are recyclable at the end of life or have closed loop ingredients or a bio-based, all of that can be disclosed here. Same thing with um, published environmental product declaration. Uh, the thing that I'm most excited about is the carbon footprint reduction. We're one of the only companies out there that are certifying uh, these carbon reductions of products when they exist. And uh, we have the ability uh, and are working with the United States Green Building Council right now uh, to be recognized as a uh, third-party verifier and certifier of optimization of products, especially embodied carbon reduction. And I personally think that if we're really going to design more sustainable buildings, we have to be looking at understanding how we're going to drive down carbon. Uh, we, we definitely want to be looking at the materials and the ingredients that are going into the products and verifying that, you know, we're doing our best to um, select products with the, the lowest impacts in that uh, area. However, uh, I think that all of us are really going to see some major uh, changes in our lives here as uh, the effects of a changing climate really come to bear here. Um, we're already seeing much crazier weather and, and, and large impacts. We have to really start thinking about resilience on how we design buildings and everything else. And the other great thing about this label is if you start looking at the manufacturing specific uh, information here, not only do we third party verify all that to demonstrate that you're buying your products from a sustainable company, but we're also uh, verifying uh, the optimization aspects. If, if a company actually reduces their carbon footprint in their factories or energy use in their factories or water use, that's gonna have a direct effect on reducing the environmental impacts of the product across the manufacturing por portion of the life cycle. Also, anything that we put on this label is uh, third-party verified. Uh, typically, uh, we are third-party verifiers for manufacturers' inventories, health product declarations, and declare labels. And I'll talk more about that in a minute here. Uh, I just want to dive into a label. This is a company we recently certified. This is Tarket, their IQ Optima product made in Ronneby, Sweden. 
which is a resilient flooring product. And you can see here we disclose recycled content, regional material, raw material sourcing, which is very important if you're still doing 2009 lead projects. We are disclosing the carbon footprint of the product uh, per functional unit, which would be in this case per square meter. If they have a take back recycling program, and, and the important point, point of that is it has to be a legitimate take back and recycling program, not just something on a website that says we take materials back. Our certifying, uh, you know, by certifying this, our auditors are checking and verifying that that information is available and we can actually have, uh, see that they're really doing a take back program and recycling and recovering the materials. Same thing with uh, published environmental product declaration, low emitting materials, all those are captured here. And every one of these will contribute to earning uh, points within the LEED standards and meeting the requirements of various credit categories. So think about this. If you have never looked at an EPD, um, these documents are, are very interesting in the fact that they provide environmental uh, impact information on based on a functional unit of product. In this particular case, it's one square meter for this uh, IQ Optima uh, product that we're talking about. And uh, basically these uh, EPDs are set up based on a third party verification of the EPD to make sure that it is meeting the requirements of ISO 14,040 and 44, as well as meeting the requirements for uh, the product category rule that was used to develop the actual EPD. In order for an EPD to be compliant with LEED standards, it must be third party verified and it must be uh, done meeting a certain product category rule. And that's what the third party verifier's job is to, to, to do that, uh, to basically review, make sure that the PCR was met. As you can see here, this particular document lists the PCR and some of the other classifications uh, for the product um, uh, that we're talking about. And then the other thing is, if you remember on the label, we had disclosed the total in, uh, amount of uh, embodied carbon within the product. So if you are not used to looking at a EPD, this is basically the table you'd have to go through. You'd have to know that uh, phases A1 through A5 are essentially, or A1 through A3 are the product stage where the ingredients and the manufacturing are captured. The construction stage is A4 and A5. Then the use uh, stage is B1 through B7. And then the end of life is this. In order to get that uh, embodied carbon number, you'd have to add up all the scientific notation to get that information. Whereas on the label, it basically is disclosed as one clear number of 6.7 uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalent per square meter. So what does that mean to you? Well, if you're designing buildings and you're trying to select lower embodied carbon pro uh, products, you can compare the products and say, all right, this particular one is 6.7 uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalent per square meter, whereas the alternative we're looking at is 22 uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalent per square meter. And then you can see, all right, this one has obviously got lower embodied carbon. For companies that are actually disclosing their carbon footprint reduction, that's where the optimization comes in. And uh, we'll talk more about that in a slide or two here. The other thing that we do is we're going to be uh, definitely third party verifying either uh, material ingredient reporting uh, via manufacturer's inventories or uh, via uh, verified declare label, verified HPD. If someone has a cradle to cradle certification, we will list it on our, uh, our uh, label and we don't have any issues with that. We do the same thing with low emitting materials. Uh, at Green Circle, we're not doing a lot of that uh, lab testing, but we do work with partners who can actually provide that for our customers uh, as they require. And we're going to talk a lot more about material ingredient reporting, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this slide right now, other than to say that in LEED version 4.1, third-party verified uh, HPDs, declare labels, and manufacturer's inventories are valued at 1.5 products out of the 20 required to earn the point, if you remember that we just talked about that. And we also do know that declare labels are uh, utilized within the living building challenge. So any third party, party verified declare label um, would be useful for that. Green Circle is a third party uh, verifier for declare labels. We're approved by International Living Futures Institute. We're also uh, been very active with the Health Product Declaration Collaborative to 
be able to third party verify HPDs. And we, we were instrumental in developing the standard on how that was done. We, we actually completed some of the first HPDs that were ever third party verified and, and worked on developing the overall process for that. And the same thing with manufacturers inventories. Uh, we worked with the uh, USGBC on that process on how we verify those. And uh, we'll talk more about those in a second as we dive into those. And I did mention here that we have, uh, if you are you know, looking for buying sustainable products, uh, first of all, it's important to note that sustainable doesn't mean one attribute. Sustainable means a lot of different things for a product, so you have to look at that. However, I think it's important to know that you're buying sustainable or greener products from green companies, and the actual third-party verification of the manufacturing-specific data will show you how a company is moving forward from a baseline year to reduce their impacts uh, from an environmental perspective, what other certifications they might have as far as ISO standards. You can see here this uh, Tarquette company, they are zero waste to landfill. Uh, that is something that Green Circle does certify. They also have uh, many other things like ISO 14001 certified, which is environmental management system, quality management. ISO 50001 means that they're working on reducing energy in their plants, and the OSHASH one means that they're actually working on uh, providing a very health and uh, healthy and safe place to work for their employees. So these are all great things to be looking for when you're trying to make decisions on what products to specify or to you know develop into your um, specifications for the projects. We do have a lot of other companies that have earned multi-attribute labels. Uh, right now there's 125 companies and pro or 125 products that we have certified. You can see here, these are some uh, uh, exit devices from for Asa Abloy. And these labels are a little different than what we saw for uh, flooring. We always are going to certify the same attributes by product category. Uh, here's a, a Norton door control, a, a door closer uh, that's been certified. Uh, this has information in it about recycled content as well as uh, EPDs and, and uh, different things they're doing in their manufacturing plant. Uh, we have here Superior Essex, which is a wire manufacturer, and they're disclosing product-specific information, how they're you know basically reducing impacts of their packaging and what they're doing as a company to improve their overall uh, manufacturing specific attributes. You can see their zero waste to landfill certified as well. And then uh, some doors, we look at doors and, and basically certify those for these attributes. And uh, this is another uh, carpet company. Uh, this is uh, Tuntex, which is in uh, China. We've actually uh, done a third party verified certified environmental facts label for them as well. So for those of you that are working internationally, you can see here that they've got um, you know, a lot of different products you can choose from uh, as you're making decisions uh, going forward and many more being added to the queue. We also do single attribute certifications. Here's some examples of some certifications we've done for uh, recycled content for uh, polyiso roofing insulation. So if you're really looking to earn recycled content from uh, credits, in any of these standards, uh, V4, V4.1, and 2009 all still have uh, credits that can be earned for recycled content. Uh, there are third-party verifications out there. I like to show this slide because this is actually real spec language that uh, was from several projects, uh, some that we obtained from our sister company and then other other lead consultants that were out there and architects that were showing how they were integrating transparency requirements into their specifications. As you can see here, this uh, particular carpet uh, spec, this division was requiring a product or material has third-party uh, certified multi-attribute certification, such as Green Circle, Cradle to Cradle. And it said here, prefer third-party certified disclosure of products with documented carbon footprint reduction and recyclability and closed loop content. And I can tell you, uh, this is a, another example of a label we've done for Interface. They actually have disclosed their uh, carbon footprint reduction, which we third party certified, as well as their take back and recyclability uh, information about the product. And uh, this product actually did win a bid recently uh, where it was integrated in a building. And this was the specs that were utilized for that particular building. You can see here uh, information on door hardware, resilient flooring, and many other divisions. So if any of you are architects or designers that are developing specs, this is information you can utilize. And I will tell you that uh, the manufacturers have stepped up to really deliver on these transparency documents. 
and now it's everyone's job to basically start asking for them and the way you ask for them is to write it into the specs so uh, this is a very good language if you're looking for examples uh, if anybody would like to have more information about this feel free to reach out to us and we can provide um, some examples of this uh, language that you could maybe you utilize and draw into your own specs going forward we are uh, actually all our certifications now push into mindful materials so if uh, a product manufacturer has a listing in mindful materials our certificates and certifications will auto automatically push there one question I want to ask you all at the end of this is what platforms do you use to look for information uh, there's a lot of them out there and I want to get a feeling for what uh, folks are using and, and, and try to get that information from you uh, so let's dive into some of the material ingredient reporting documents this is where it's it's kind of challenging uh, because it's hard to understand what these things really mean especially if you're trained as an engineer or an architect or a designer or you know your environmental scientist that's really in the green building and you're doing uh, you know lead consulting and you're trying to document all these projects you know what the heck do these things even mean and the thing is remember 20 permanently installed products from five different manufacturers that have some form of material ingredient report and what you can see here is option one is the one uh, aspect in lead version four where if you can get 20 of these things you can actually uh, earn this point and you have various choices on your uh, material ingredient reports you can use manufacturers inventories health product declarations cradle to cradle declare uh, I believe uh, product lens now is another one and I'm sure there's others coming out that will allow you to earn that point for material ingredient reporting and again this is a bean counter one where you just got to get 20 permanently installed products uh, under option two the material ingredient optimization that has been refined in lead v4.1 now that does uh, provide additional credits for uh, companies and product manufacturers that have been third-party verified for their uh, HPDs, declares, or manufacturers inventories. And uh, there's also an option called option three within V4, which I'm gonna talk about, uh, which was done, we actually did a certification for that under a pilot certification for Millican. And uh, we'll chat about that in a minute. So when we talk about HPDs, uh, health product declarations, this is uh, an example of one that uh, we did the third-party verification for for Tuntex, uh, which is that carpet back carpet uh, manufacturer uh, out of China. And the one thing that's important to note is if you're looking for compliance with HPDs, you have to verify that either the 100 ppm or the 1,000 ppm uh, areas are checked right here. If they're not, uh, then there's a, a good likelihood that if you submit it, uh, USGBC will not count it towards your 20. Uh, products that have these uh, material ingredient reports also important to note that this list over here characterized means that all the products were analyzed on a percent by weight basis and the role is provided for everything in the carpet it was screened using a uh, priority hazard list uh, both using Pharos and Toxnot and then identified means that there's no proprietary ingredients and the name and the CAS number of all the products has been disclosed. So you can see here in this particular case, uh, characterized yes, screened yes, identified no is checked because there were some proprietaries where only the role uh, of, and the, the name and the role uh, and the percentage of the uh, material was disclosed and not the actual chemical or CAS number. So I would imagine most of you on this call are not toxicologists or chemists, and you're you know, probably an architect, a designer, lead consultant, or building owner, and suddenly you're trying to figure out what the heck does all this mean. And uh, you're gonna see things on here, like for example, if it was third-party verified, it's gonna be checked as that. Again, this counts for 1.5 products in lead version 4.1, so there is value to this. And I can tell you, having done uh, multiple third-party verifications for declares and HPDs and manufacturers inventories, we are seeing that uh, there are more ingredients typically being disclosed in the third-party verified versions than the ones that aren't. And that's not to say, I'm not saying the manufacturers are trying to hide anything. I think it's just a complicated 
situation on understanding what actually needs to be disclosed. The fact that you have to go down to various tiny, minute hundred parts per million or thousand parts per million levels, which is a very small amount of materials in a product, and you could be in the level of pigments and, and additives and all kinds of other things that have to be assessed. Another thing you're going to see when you look at an HPD is the fact that some of these materials might draw a uh, hazard, a significant hazard like cancer. In this particular uh, aspect we can see here it's drawn by solid glass and glass mineral fiber uh, materials that are in this carpet tile. Carpet tiles start out usually uh, the backing starts out with a roll of uh, fiberglass mat which is basically unrolled and coated with whatever the, the backing that's going to be utilized as a substrate to hold the backing. And what's interesting about this cancer hazard here is, uh, you know, we have to ask, what does it really mean? Well, if we really dig into this, uh, we can say that where did the hazard actually happen? Is it is it in the carpet right now as it exists in the form of the fiberglass mat, or is it somewhere else in the life cycle? And if we really look at this, we know that if we go backwards to make fiberglass mat, you're going to start out with sand that is dumped into a, a glass melt tank to fiberize that sand and make it into uh, the fiberglass mat. It's almost like a, a large uh, uh, cotton candy machine when they make this stuff. And what what's going on is when that sand is dumped into the tank, there's silica that can be, you know, dust that's basically coming off the sand. And if you breathe out, there's potential to, to uh, get hazard or get cancer if you are exposed to this over a long enough time period. So it's really important to note, what does it really mean? Hazards are in just about everything we utilize every day. I'm sitting here in my office right now looking out a window that's made out of glass that also started with sand. So I'm sure this, this window probably has a cancer hazard if it had an HPD or a declare label on it or if it had a manufacturer's inventory. I'm also looking at the the cement that's in between the bricks in my building here and uh, there's a good possibility that there's uh, materials in there that could draw some different hazards for exposure but right now the way these things are sitting in my office there's really no dust coming off the mortar and the bricks there's no nothing coming off the glass it's solid material so it's important to understand where does the exposure happen where is the hazard being drawn and all these different things so uh, it's important to note these things and to think about that. And you know, we don't want to be uh, just assuming that just because a product has a label uh, that there is a, uh, a hazard to it, that there is any major risk of exposure to um, people. And usually, what happens if it's drawn in a manufacturing setting, uh, OSHA controls how the manufacturers are supposed to be minimizing their impacts or exposures of their employees, so there's a lot of controls out there for that. So whether you're looking at a declare label, an HPD, or a manufacturer's inventory, just keep this in mind going forward. For uh, manufacturer's inventories, I do want to talk about them because they're kind of new and uh, there's been a lot of questions about how these things are done and what they disclose. Uh, basically what LEED requires is that for manufacturers that create a manufacturer's inventory, that they're going to basically uh, provide a publicly available inventory of all ingredients that are publicly disclosed. That would include chemical abstract service numbers, CAS numbers, or European community number, EC numbers. And for materials that are proprietary or deemed as trade secret or intellectual property, then uh, manufacturers are required to disclose the role, the amount, and the hazard screen uh, using either green screen, or the GHS, Globally Harmonized System for Classification and Labeling of Chemicals. And uh, this is an area where um, we have done some certification work for manufacturer's inventory. BASF is a, a company that has gone forward with this. And what we did is we actually certified their chemical management system, how they handle and screen all the materials that they produce. Remember, a BASF or a Dow or, or a MAPE or other companies like that, they're actually um, a lot of times making ingredients that go into products or making uh, materials or products that have a lot of ingredients in them and, and they're not, uh, you know, 
maybe fully finished as you would say or or they are a lot of their materials are blended into a fully finished product and it I'll explain that a little more as I go into this but if, as you can see here with BASF we certified their chemical management system that means our team was out at their site evaluating how they're doing their hazard screening and evaluation of all the chemicals they make how they utilize that to create their SDS sheets and how they look at that to understand risk and exposure uh, of the products and uh, basically uh, to verify that they were following a consistent and well-documented and established process to do that. And I, I can tell you that um, the large chemical companies are definitely following this process because it's, it's a, they're regulated to do so. Uh, this is an example of the manufacturer's inventory for one of the BASF products, as you can see here, for all publicly disclosed, disclosed products. Uh, we actually have uh, CAS numbers and the chemical name. For proprietary ingredients, though, uh, the role of the, the substance is listed, the amount in the product is listed in a range, and then hazard category, what this means is when it says below GHS reporting threshold, what that means is this particular ingredient is drawing no listed hazard. And what Green Circle does is when we actually evaluate these, we get to look at all the great detailed work that the manufacturers are doing to analyze this using GHS and other um, risk and, and, and screening methods within their organization. We also then run those ingredients, which we actually know the names of the ingredients because we have NDAs with these companies. We run those ingredients then through Pharos and Toxnot to see if it's consistent with hazards that are being drawn by those uh, methods of evaluating the products versus what GHS is identifying. So we actually get to really dive in and dig deep on these and third party verify that these are being disclosed uh, in the right manner. This is another example of what these can look like. The one thing that uh, is important to note that uh, HPDs have a standard format, the CLER has a standard format. For manufacturer's inventories, there's really no clear defined standard format. You just have to make sure you're uh, listing the information. So you can see that BASF has done things a little differently, whereas MAPE, which is another company we've certified, uh, they've actually provided some additional information. Uh, notice here, if it's a trade secret, they list it as that. They do provide the role and they do provide the ingredient uh, amount. And then they, they did their screening per green screen instead of GHS. So they basically list the green screen list translator score. The other thing we looked at is where there aren't any red listed chemicals uh, per the uh, Living Building Challenge International Living Futures Institute red list. So this has all been third party verified. MAPE, we actually verified their whole chemical management system. And then Dow, we, we've done the same thing. We evaluated their chemical management system. And these two products are actually final products that are utilized directly in a building, whereas uh, Dow also has disclosed some ingredients that end up going into building products. So you can see here this, this uh, Roflex EC1791 emulsion is actually a chemical ingredient that would be utilized within building products. And uh, as you can see on these, uh, basically disclosing the name, cast number, and any hazards that were drawn, if there are proprietary ingredients, the role, the percent by weight, and the GHS uh, hazard category, if any hazards were drawn, uh, that is clearly listed there. So, um, and this is another example of a manufacturer's inventory that was done by Tarquette for their IQ Optima. Uh, basically, you can see a different level of disclosure, different information. They call this the material health statement which is classified under the manufacturer's inventories. So again, these are very legitimate uh, disclosures. Uh, when you look at them compared to an HPD, you'll probably say, well, there's more information in an HPD. Uh, the HPDs, a lot of them are self-disclosed and not third-party verified. So I can tell you though, that any manufacturer's inventories that we've done have been third-party verified and we are screening all of these chemicals and identifying when there are issues with them. So. Again, very solid, legitimate way to meet the requirement and lead. Uh, declare, uh, these are a few of the declare labels that we've third party verified, one for Osobloy, one for Mannington. And uh, you can see these are a lot different uh, in the fact that all these do is disclose uh, the different names of 
materials that are in the product. Uh, they, these don't disclose any uh, hazards or anything like this. It's just a list of chemical ingredients. It's almost like looking at the back of your toothpaste where you can see what these are. So what needs to be done here is if you are interested in understanding these chemicals and what the hazards are, you're going to have to run all these through some kind of screening tool like Pharos or Toxnot. Uh, I will say that uh, there are specific requirements around the CLARE and the Living Building Challenge. Uh, you know, the CLARE labels do need to be disclosed down to a thousand par or a hundred parts per million instead of a thousand parts per million like a uh, HPD, although HPDs can be a hundred parts per million. Uh, it is self-disclosure of all ingredients uh, and basically that you're only allowed to have one percent proprietary in a uh, product with a DECLARE label. So oftentimes there's manufacturers that want to do declare label, but they have more than 1% proprietary. Uh, they may have some red listed ingredients. They may have some other issues. And oftentimes what will happen is those manufacturers will definitely then move to a platform like a HPD uh, because they just aren't able to meet all the requirements of a particular declare label. Uh, let's just talk quickly about option two, material ingredient optimization. Uh, again, these marks that you see here, we developed in coordination and consultation with the United States Green Building Council. And uh, as of right now, we haven't really done any option two uh, material ingredient optimization certifications. However, I do want to reiterate that for V4.1, if you are uh, selecting products that have a third party verified HPD declare or manufacturer's inventory, they count as 1.5 products, knowing that, that those things have gone through an additional level of scrutiny, uh, which is important to note. For option three, though, we have gone through a pilot certification and analysis for Millican for their Wellback Comfort Plus product, which is, uh, uh, I believe, a carpet. And what this is in option three, you're actually evaluating, we evaluated the company's uh, chemical management system and then evaluated all their suppliers to see that Millican actually communicated to those suppliers that they wanted them to be considering the, the ingredients and the hazards within their chemicals all the way down the supply chain. So we did go through this pilot certification and uh, right now option three is still very active within V4. However, in V4.1, this option is no longer um, being utilized. Uh, I would expect maybe in the future this will come back uh, because I think it's a really good thing to start pushing this down the supply chain. So I do think I'm getting near the end of my slides here and I want to take questions, so please type your questions in if you haven't already. It looks like I have one or two that are already in there, so please add some more. Uh, for the future material ingredient reporting, what do I see? I see it's going to be more than a checkbox and lead, especially as more government agencies and others start requiring this information. Companies like Target and Walmart are starting to look at ingredients in some of the products they sell. So this is something that's going to be more prevalent in the marketplace. Uh, I do think it's going to be going beyond a list of ingredients and really starting to look at hazards, uh, linking those hazards to actual risk and exposure. I know here at Green Circle, we're working on a platform to do that and a means of disclosing and certifying that. Uh, so you, the folks that are selecting these products, can have more than just a bunch of hazards listed but really understanding where risk of exposure occurs in the, in the life cycle and what phases and how those risks are being mitigated uh, to minimize exposure uh, for anybody that's coming in contact with these products. I think there's going to be a lot more education uh, going on. I know that I teach at Villanova University. We have a master's in sustainable engineering, and I'm actively teaching all my students about this in my sustainable buildings and operations class, and many of our employees here at Green Circle and our sister company, Sustainable Solutions, teach in university settings, and they're teaching future architects and designers about what these things mean, how to read them, how to use them. I think we'll see a lot more data accessibility coming out in the future as more and more suppliers are assessed and more products are assessed. And I think this is really going to expand way outside of green buildings. So uh, I do want to really make sure that we talk about this uh, point of using transparency documents to design more sustainable buildings. Uh, EPDs and multi-attribute labels really will allow you to understand the products that you're selecting, as in, especially when it comes to embodied carbon. So definitely utilize those. Uh, I, I would encourage people to start really thinking about how to reduce 
the embodied carbon of buildings and other even even products you use in your everyday life what can you do looking for products with lower environmental impacts um, and considering circular or closed loop you know we have a situation where we're going to have nine and a half billion people on this planet by 2050 which is not very far away um, only about 31 years and I am thinking I will probably see 2050 uh, even though I'm a little older than probably some of you on this call and uh, I think it's important that we're we're all thinking about the future here um, and you know it's gonna be really tough to provide the same standard of living that all of us have to another you know five billion people on the planet that want to live like us uh, I also think that we're going to be able to use this information for looking for optimized products, those companies that have reduced environmental impacts and done things around material ingredient reporting to, you know, reduce uh, any kind of hazards or risks or exposures. And then I think it's, it's critical to note that every one of us that's involved in the building industry has the opportunity to um, make decisions here and to use this as more than just a bean count. Uh, to, to basically select the products with the most sustainable attributes and um, to build that into our specs and, and drive things forward. So before I dive in here, I just wanted to throw out a couple questions to some of you. You know, are, are any of you at this point integrating transparency requirements into your specifications? Um, if you can just go into the question box and, you know, let me know yes or no, uh, that would be interesting to know. And are you also looking at, um, third-party verification the requirement for that in your specifications because I do think that's another important area uh, I would also ask uh, do you ever look at multi-attribute certifications and uh, you know how do you how do you do that like how how are you using that information so um, really important uh, to think about that and are you considering embodied carbon for products um, so I have a question here it says can you give a basic explanation of carbon how it relates to a product and how uh, the measurement of carbon is derived okay so that's a great question thank you for asking that uh, when we think about embodied carbon when we run a life cycle assessment we're going to be understanding the global warming potential of a product across its life cycle that's another that's another word for um, embodied carbon or carbon footprint of the product and we use software that allows us to identify that you know what are the uh, carbon impacts of the raw materials that went in what are the carbon impacts of the manufacturing think about it if you're doing if you're manufacturing a product and you're using electricity or natural gas then you are indirectly connected to creating a carbon footprint of that product for all of us you know if you take a shower in the morning or you drive a car into work you are basically you you have a carbon footprint because you're burning fuel in your vehicle uh, even if even if you're using an electric vehicle that you're charging um, there's going to be carbon emitted from making the electricity that charge your electric vehicle and if you're taking a shower that means you're using hot water and you're you're using electricity for that water to be moved into your into your building somehow so when we look at embodied carbon we're trying to understand all right what's the carbon that's embedded within the, the product and there can actually be carbon uh, embedded from ingredients for example uh, I showed you earlier that Tarquette product that was a resilient floor resilient flooring means it's probably polyvinyl chloride which means there's actually natural gas that gets utilized to create ethylene that then becomes um, part of the vinyl chloride monomer that makes vinyl resin so that embodied that the fact that we put fossil fuels into the product that's measured as well and then if there's any kind of use phase impacts of the product let's say it uses energy or there's cleaning or maintenance required of a, of a particular material like a floor for example there's going to be a carbon footprint associated with the use phase then so we capture all that information and we document that as the embodied carbon of the product and the different product category rules for the various uh, products that are out there dictates you know what phases you're going to look at in the life cycle how, what uh, impact categories you're going to be looking at so looking at that carbon is really important and again you can demonstrate a greener product by reducing the embodied carbon or the carbon footprint of it uh, if you remember I showed you that interface label um, near that specification 
slide that, that basically showed how uh, the carbon was reduced. And that was driven mainly by material changes, going more closed loop and integrating recycled materials like old carpet back in the new carpet, which meant we didn't have to start using raw materials out of the earth to make nylon and other materials that go into carpet. And they also drove it by really reducing their manufacturing impacts, using a lot less energy, water, creating a lot less waste, using renewable energy uh, purchased for their factories, which entirely reduced the manufacturer uh, impacts of that product. So it's pretty complicated when you look at that, but there's a lot of things that go into that embodied carbon aspect. So what are the questions that we have here? It looks like I have um, another one here. Um, the question is, uh, what is, what happens, uh, wait, there's a lot more here. Uh, let's see how I make this bigger. Oops. Okay, I'm getting a lot of, we, do you do not currently, okay, so some people are just responding to how they're, you know, the questions I asked, uh, but there is a question here about material ingredient reporting and uh, HPDs, uh, I, they wanted to ask to, to talk more about the, the requirements for LEED. So again, if you are looking at an HPD, you have to make sure that the checkbox for 100 parts per million or 1,000 parts per million is checked. And uh, we have seen situations where manufacturers have created these documents and did not check those. When those were submitted to USGBC for uh, documentation, they were declined because they didn't meet the minimum requirements for disclosure. So that is an important aspect to be considering as you as you look forward there. Okay, uh, do we have any other questions? I have, uh, looks like two more minutes here. If you have any others, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, looking here. Okay, looks like uh, one other question. Uh, the question is around lead v, v 4.1. Uh, is it is it difficult to um, how how do those credits get replaced with v 4.1 and v 4? Well, my understanding from my discussions with USGBC is uh, that there will be uh, a direct link to v 4.1. So the credits in v 4.1 can be integrated within your V4 projects if you would like. And my understanding is even on 2009 projects, you can bring in V4.1 credits. So if you're looking to earn additional points and you want to have a situation where you want to maybe drive optimization, uh, you could definitely be looking at uh, utilizing those V4.1 credits as a means of encouraging the uh, suppliers and product manufacturers to disclose that information to you on, on optimized products. So with that, it looks like we're about at the end of time. I think I've answered all the questions that were typed in. We're, we're looking forward to um, uh, hearing more. Um, there was another question here. It doesn't seem to work. When this will be launched and available for your database. Um, Oh, there's another question here. Do we have a preference on requiring disclosures within the product spec or the general specs? I think it's best if you can put them in the specific division. However, a lot of times you're going to have a lead requirements section or general section in the specs. They should definitely be in there. But ideally, if you can get them in the divisions, that would be ideal as well, because that way uh, people are actually going to see them in the divisions where it's easy for a supplier or a gen or a subcontractor to say, oh, we, we forgot to look at the general section or the lead requirement section. So I'm a big fan if, if, if you can get them into all divisions to build those requirements, not only in the front, but into every division. So that's what I would recommend there. So anyway, right, with that, we're right at the top of three o'clock. Uh, thank you very much.